Good morning again. It is good to be with you. I love that we love being together. It's so fun. Um, it's a, a real privilege, it's an honor to get to introduce Dr. Rick Langer to you this morning. Uh, Rick has been a pastor in Southern California. He has been a professor of theology at Biola University at both the undergraduate level, the postgraduate level. Uh, he is an author, he has hosted podcasts, he's the co-founder of what's called Win The Winsome Conviction. And I wanna read this because it's, this is such a powerful mission, but uh, The Winsome Conviction is a project launched from a heartfelt concern for the toxic, polarized, and simply unloving communication climate that is permeating our nation and penetrating the body of Christ. It's powerful, and this is what, this is what uh, Dr. Langer is working on. This is his field that he is an expert in. We've invited him to come and talk with us about this. And so again, he's written books, taught courses, hosted podcasts, and we have an incredible opportunity to learn from him this morning, next Sunday, and again at the midweek lecture. So we invite you to, to take advantage of this opportunity, and would you welcome with me Dr. Rick Langer. Sir. Thank you, Danny. It's great to be here with you guys. I've been uh, having Zoom calls with Danny and Dale for the last however many months here in the course of so it's fun to actually be here live and in person. Um, I don't know if you guys heard, but there's an election coming up in a couple of weeks. Yeah. I mean, seriously, who knew, right? I, I uh, got for my birthday a new iWatch, not so much because I was all excited about getting an iWatch, but my old watch just plain died, and uh, so this became my birthday present. And it gives all these, it gives all these notifications, and I, I suddenly realized if I blocked all notifications that included the word Harris, Trump, or election, my, my watch wouldn't go into sleep mode, it would go into full hibernation. I would probably have to break out the defibrillators to wake it up again once the election was over and I wanted to actually get some news. So, yeah, this is a very, very charged, controversial time uh, in our country, particularly relative to this election. I have been around uh, several years. Uh, I have been through more than one election cycle. And I have to admit, this is probably the most contentious election cycle that I have been a part of. Um, and so I, I worry about that, and I do think that this is an important thing to talk about. I think it's an important thing to talk about in church. I don't think this is just a political issue. I think this is a spiritual issue. And I think we should be thinking about things like this spiritually. But I probably have a bit of a different angle on that issue than some people do. Because for some people who say, yes, we need to think Christianly about the election, our primary concern is what's going on with the state of our country and therefore who should I vote for? And my primary concern when I think about the election is what's going on with the state of the church and what is the condition of our souls? Because I'm a pastor, not a politician. If I'm a professor, it's because I'm a professor of theology. <laughs> and I worry about people's souls. And I worry about what's going on in the soul of the church and the souls of the individuals who make up the church in the midst of this election cycle. There's a lot of people who are worried that we're losing our hold on America. I'm worried that the church is losing its hold on Jesus a little bit. And I would like to think a little bit about why that's happening and what we can actually do about that. Now, I know that some people, when, when I say something like this, are we losing our hold on Jesus or losing our hold on America? Uh, there's no question in their mind which of the two is more important. But somewhere deep in their soul, they're saying, ah, you know, calm down, Rick. The church is doing fine. I have a great time here at church. I have good friends in church. The church is okay. America, on the other hand, I'm really, really worried about. And I would like to argue that actually our first concerns should be about the church, and our second concerns should be about our country. And let me, I'm not, that's not the actual main topic of this sermon, but let me just give a quick reminder about why I say that. The words the Bible gives us to describe our attachment to the person of Christ are words like disciple, 
that is a person who follows, and not just in the Bible, the person who follows, the person who follows and refuses to look back, the person who does not give up once they put their hand to the plow. That's what a disciple means, and that is how we're described. We're described as sons and daughters of God. And you know what? There's never a day when you wake up and your son or daughter is no longer your son or daughter. They are always your son or daughter. And the Bible describes us also as bond slaves, as servants who are bound to Jesus for their entire life. So I would like to point out that all of these terms that describe us in our relationship with Christ are terms that never change. And it's interesting when he describes our relationship with our country, our political point of attachment, the citizenship that we have, he uses words, the Bible uses words like alien and exile. It uses words like sojourner. It uses words like ambassador. And I would like to point out the ambassador is not unconcerned with the country he is, you know, ambassadoring to. What? There must be some word for being an ambassador. The country he's sent to, he's not unconcerned with that country, but he is concerned with that country through the lens of the country which sent him, right? He is concerned about the things that concern the country of his origin in the country that he is currently located. His primary attachments go to the citizenship that is really his. And again, biblically, we are citizens of heaven, not citizens of our present earth. So it isn't that we don't care about America, but it's a second thing for us as Christians, not a first thing. And that's a pretty important thing to think about. And then when I think about the condition of the church and the condition of our souls, It's interesting if I say, what is the best marker for the condition of your soul? And I don't want to make this complicated. Let me just say, I think the easiest way to figure that out is, are you more marked by the fruit of the Spirit or by the fruit of the flesh, the works of the flesh? And let me just give you a little sample reading of these two things and start thinking about what am I experiencing in my world, in my church, in my own soul? The works of the flesh are marked by enmity, strife, anger, rivalries, and divisions. I'm just taking this straight out of Galatians chapter 5. The work of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, is marked by things like peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and gentleness. And let me just ask, which river are we swimming in? In the culture... I think it's an easy thing to say, yeah, the culture's doing all this, but the church is different. But I'm worried that the church is increasingly following the culture in terms of being marked by things like division and anger, rivalry, strife. Factions is another term that sometimes is used to translate one of the fruit of the, uh, one of the works of the flesh. So these are things that I'm going, I'm worried that this is creeping into the church. So what I want to do in the next couple of weeks, so this week and next week, so the the two times I'm here with you guys, is to just think a little bit about this. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about the negative side. In other words, what are some of the works of the flesh that seem to be working their way into our church and our own lives? And let me just point out, I'm not talking about something that's uh, crazy that's never happened for me. This is the ongoing battle of the Christian life, right? This is not something new. I'm just saying... We're at a point where there's a bit of a crisis on this issue, I think, and we need to be aware of this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that I think are creeping in that we should be getting rid of. And next week, what I want to talk about is some things that we need to be doing, the positive through the spirit things that I'm worried worried that we're losing our grip on. Does that make sense? So there's certain things that we've got that we should probably not have. There's certain things we need to have that we need to cultivate that I'm not sure we're we're getting a good crop of. So those are the things that I want to do today. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on some of these issues that are related to these uh, kind of negative or problematic things I see rising up that Paul identifies with things like fruit of the, well, of Satan, not of the spirit in our lives. All right. With that said... When you talk about things like anger, wrath, malice is another phrase, you know, from, from lists that we get in Scripture, you, you might call a vice list. Um, I'm like, you know, the funny thing about that, I have been 
in vocational Christian ministry for almost 43 years. So I've seen a lot of stuff. But that said, in the bulk of that time, when I've thought of what is it like to be at the church, I haven't actually said it's a bucket of anger and strife and malice and all these other things. By and large, my experience in churches of people have been generally nice to each other. I know there's always the dark underside. There's these things that go on. I get it. But in the big picture, when I think of the ethos, that hasn't been the case. What's weird to me is suddenly I feel like in the last eight, ten years, this has risen to the surface and becoming much more a daily activity. And part of why I say this isn't just my own experience, but talking to pastors about the experience of strife within their own body of Christ and divisions and splits about those things. Uh, and I go, why did that suddenly come up? What is it that has happened to us that has made us so prone to those sorts of things? And anger is an interesting emotion. It's what, what uh, psychologists will call a secondary emotion. In other words, you have primary emotions like commonly fear, sometimes sadness or loss, things like that that are just a direct response to the experience you have. And anger tends to be what arises after you're experiencing one of these other things. And the bottom line is anger is commonly associated with loss. You're angry because you have lost something. Have you ever met someone who lost a loved one or someone else has ended up angry at God? And anger comes from the sense of loss. The other thing that's very common is people get afraid and they become angry in response. If you've ever met a wild animal, that's a classic example. The worst thing you can do to an animal is make it afraid because when it's afraid, it gets angry. And rather than talk about the anger, what I wanna do today is talk a little bit about fear, which I think in our current moment is the root that is giving us so much of the anger and strife that we face. I think we live in a culture of fear. And it's particularly attached, in this case, to things around politics and the election. Now, you may be wondering why I say that. There was, in 2016, there was an article written called the Flight 93 election. Have anyone heard of that? The Flight 93 election? Yeah, there's a couple of you out there. It's kind of a thing, for, at least for a niche market of people who tend to read some of this stuff. But let me just read the inner, there's a pretty famous little article, and this is just the beginning phrases of that. 2016 is the Flight 93 election. Charge the cockpit or you die. You may die anyway. You or the leader of your party may make it to the cockpit and not know how to fly or land the plane. There's no guarantees except one. If you don't try, death is certain. Wow. And I'd like to point out that was 2016. 2020 election came through, and we picked up on the same theme. A multitude of people are saying, you know what? If Trump is reelected, the world will end as we know it. Another batch of people, roughly speaking, if Biden is elected, the world will end as we know it. Let me just make an observation. We're now in 2024. Both Trump and Biden have been elected, and guess what? The world hasn't actually ended. But we're still talking like it will or it has. Here's a set of quotes. This, these ones happen to come from a Republican context. I'll give you some from the Democrats right after this. But America will be ruined if the other side wins. World War III will break out, perhaps a global nuclear war. Murderous immigrant gangs will overrun cities, small towns, the state of Colorado. I'm in Colorado at the moment, so I found out about this. I didn't even know. The entire country... Factories will shut down, farmers will lose their farms, and the U.S. will face an economic bloodbath. These are just quotes from these people who say. And you can feel the apocalyptic nature of the fears described there. In response to some of this, I just happened to bump into this just yesterday. I saw this headline. Four good reasons Democrats are terrified about the 2024 election, and the whole article is about why Democrats have a better reason to have apocalyptic fears than the Republicans do. So the bottom line is we are swimming in a culture of fear right now. The current of our culture is a fearful one. And I think that fosters anger in our conversations because we're really afraid at a very deep level. 
Marilyn Robinson, if you have ever read um, some of her books, she's a Pulitzer Prize winning, devout Christian author. She's a wonderful, wonderful author and thinker. She writes novels, that's what she won the Pulitzer Prize for, but she's also a wonderful essayist. And she was commenting on this, and she says, I have this thesis, a two-part thesis. First, contemporary America is full of fear, and second, fear is not a Christian habit of mind. As children, we learn to say, yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. We learn that after his resurrection, Jesus told the disciples, lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. Christ is a gracious, abiding presence in all reality, and in him, history will finally be resolved. We are taught that Christ was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. Fear is not a Christian habit of mind. And when we float in that current, that current is taking us to places that are harmful, that are hurtful for the condition of our soul. So what I'd like to do with the rest of my time is to talk about this issue of fear. And I don't really want to say, hey, don't worry, be happy. I don't want to say, oh, your fears are overblown. Uh, because there's actually big things that, that are proper to be afraid of. What I do want to say is not that we need to diminish our fears, but we need to right-size our fears. And most importantly, we need to right-size our fears relative to the size of our God. And we need to make sure that we see our God as bigger than our fears. Because if we don't, we will get sucked down that current of fear and begin to find destructive things happening within our own souls. Now, you've probably had the experience of people saying things like, when you're afraid, don't be afraid. You have probably said that didn't work. So what I would like to do is dive a little bit more deeply into the issue of fear and think a little bit more about some of the resources that we have from Christ in terms of dealing with the things that might make us afraid. Because as I say, I'm not worried about irrational fears. Some people have those, and that's great. But the bottom line is I'm just worried about legitimate fears, things we have a good reason to be afraid of. How do we navigate those kinds of things? One of the best passages I know for, for thinking about that is Psalm 46. And so let me just read that psalm and then just take a few moments to unpack some of the things we find within its words. The psalmist writes, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth will melt away. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord. Desolations he's brought on earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, shatters the spear, and burns the shield with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. These are words for fear-inducing times. These are words for times when you're facing real and legitimate fears, and you need to ask yourself the question, what will I do with this thing that is making me so fearful? Will I become angry? Will I fight back? Or will I find faith and trust in the Lord? 
So let me just unpack three things really that are, are given to us in this passage I think really help us in terms of navigating things about our fear. The first is that God is our refuge, then that God is our help, and finally that God is our hope. And really all I'm doing is working my way directly through that passage. There's nothing fancy going on here, but I want us to take a few minutes to top, stop and savor those things, a refuge, a help, and a hope. First, that God is our refuge. It says this in verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And let me just point out a refuge, if you have a mentor, in, uh, later in the uh, psalm it talks about being a fortress. So think of refuge, fortress, that sort of a thing. This is a place you go uh, when there's a great peril that you're facing and you've run out of other places to run. You run to the refuge. It's the place that, that you go to when there's no other safe place to go. And let me point out, a refuge only works when you abide within it. It doesn't do any good to have, hey, I got a wonderful refuge back there, but I'm sitting here on the other side of the river. Uh, when you need the refuge, refuge, you need to abide in the refuge. You need to stick with it. And this passage is saying that God is our refuge. And if we want him to work as a refuge in the midst of our fears, the first thing we have to do is abide with him. A refuge doesn't work if you're not there. And the thing that I think is perhaps most important and most challenging about that is that we have to decide, we have to make up our minds that we will abide no matter what. No matter what's pounding at the door, no matter what's launching over the walls, we will abide. Sometimes, who rescue us from the thing we fear, Sometimes he rescues us through the thing we fear, but in all cases, he will rescue us. Sometimes Sennacherib is at the gate, uh, 2 Kings 19. So the Assyrian general Sennacherib is besieging Jerusalem. And he is shouting, he's mocking Hezekiah, he's mocking the people who... who uh, are believing Hezekiah. He's telling him, ha, he can't do anything. You know, come out, you, you know, line up with me, join my side because you're going to get torched. That's basically his message. Uh, and the amazing thing that happens is that God speaks and says, you know what? Don't worry about this. And God speaks and a plague comes that night and uh, kills, I think, 180,000 Assyrian troops or whatever the number is. And Sennacherib flees and goes back to Assyria. And God saved Jerusalem from the armies that were outside their walls. But read on. In Jeremiah 39, it's not Sennacherib who is outside the walls of Jerusalem with his army, but Nebuchadnezzar. And when Nebuchadnezzar is outside, he ends up breaking down the walls and burning Jerusalem. If you want to know how Jeremiah felt about it, read the book of Lamentations. But the interesting thing is, even when that happened, the promise of Jeremiah was not that, that Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't conquer Jerusalem in that moment, but that God would save Israel nonetheless. He might save Israel from exile, as he did relative to the Assyrians. He might save Israel through exile, as he did relative to the Babylonians. But the message is always, abide in your refuge. <laughs> Do not flee, do not let go of God. The thing you fear might actually happen. Nonetheless, the best place for you to be is with God. If God is your refuge, it's a call to abide. This is an absolute theme of Scripture. Job uh, 15, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. Habakkuk chapter 3, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. 
the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Daniel chapter three, one of our favorite stories to tell, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king and they said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. I don't know if I'll be saved from the fire or through the fire. I just know the one thing I'm not going to do is let go of God. He's my refuge, and in him I will abide. God is also our help. Um, the image of a help, and you see this described in the, there's basically a series of things described in the psalm, acts of nature and acts of nations. <laughs> So the nations are raging, the nations are warring and all these sorts of things that I will save you through those things. He talks about the earth quaking, the seas roaring, the mountains dissolving, acts of nature. We're like we, we live in California, right? We are experts on both of these kinds of things. Crazy things happen in our nation, crazy things happen in our nature, and here's the message. God is still your help in the midst of all of those sorts of things that are going on. Um, and the bottom line is, in all of these things, the acts of God are one step bigger than any of those other acts. Like I say, the goal here is not to eliminate the fear, but to right-size it relative to how big a deal God is. Um, you feel peace, not because your fears are small, but because your God is big. Perhaps the only takeaway of this is ultimately that we face our fears and say, but God is bigger, but God is bigger. I am reminded of this when I think of an uh, experience I had when my son, uh, he was probably three or four years old, and we were down at Dana Point, and I don't know if you've ever been around the Dana Point in Southern California Beach area there, but they have a great big jetty that they built. Those jetties are made out of these, like, rocks the size of a little VW bug, you know, sort of thing. So, so they're a big mammoth pile of rocks. And we're out there early one morning, and uh, we're walking along the jetty. And, of course, for Mark, he's three or four years old, and so jumping from rock to rock is really pretty much the non-starter. So we're kind of, you know, staggering along here, going up and down all this. And I just told him, just hold on to my hand, Mark, and we'll be fine. So... He has got like this death grip on my index finger. It's turning purple down there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to revive this thing or cut it off after this hike, you know. So we're walking along there, and the waves are kind of big, but they're kind of doing the washy, washy up and down thing. Well, we come around the corner, and the waves decide it's time to crash. And so the first one has gone like, oh, that's a good one. But, you know, these are big rocks. The water isn't really going to be a big problem. And then the next one hits, and there's a little bit of spray that hits Mark, and finally one of these big ones comes in, and it just crashes. You can almost feel the whole thing shake. And he's got this death grip on my finger until that one comes. And then he goes, ha! Ah! And it's like, there goes the death grip on the finger. But here's the good news. It didn't matter how tight he held my finger. What mattered was how tight I was holding his hand. He let go. I held on. He was fine. And that's what it's like with us and God. There are big things that come, and the next one that comes may be bigger, and sometimes you feel like, wow! You know, the good news is if you abide close enough for God to hold on, you'll discover that he holds on better to you than you hold on to him. He is your help. He is the one who gives you strength when you don't have the strength on your own. And finally, God is our hope. Um, this passage is kind of an interesting one because it's describing a whole set of things that are kind of happening. And then he kind of looks ahead and he says, Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on earth. He makes wars cease 
to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, shatters the spear, he burns the chariots of fire. And let me just make the observation, this language is fairly common in the Old Testament, and it always has a sort of eschatological looking ahead to the day in which our swords will be beaten into plowshares, the bows will be broken, all of that sort of thing. It's looking forward to the future coming of a kingdom in which God will reign and set all things right. Uh, and that's part of what's going on in this passage when he says, you know, your hopes in God are well-founded. They won't all be fulfilled in the particular moment that you're worried about. You may be worried about Sennacherib. You may be worried about Nebuchadnezzar. You may be worried about the, uh, you know, the wave coming in, whatever it is that you're facing. God's saying, God will tend you, either keep you from that or keep you through that. But the other thing is that so many of the things we long for, so many of the things we hope for, are still yet to come. God will bring those things, and it's that sort of long-term hope that is often our best cure for our fears. Uh, one of the things we need to remind ourselves of is this whole life that we're a part of isn't just our story. In fact, it isn't first and foremost our story, but rather God's story. And I think a lot of times you wish God would just write blog posts. So he, you know, gets to the end, makes the point, everything's happy at the end of 1,500 words. God apparently is fixated on Russian novels. It isn't 1,500 words. It's like 1,500 pages, and the thing keeps going on. And at page 39 or chapter 39, everything's going to pot. And all we have to say is just turn the page. If everything's going to pot, you just want to remember the story isn't over yet. There's another chapter coming. And that's very much the image that you see in this passage, that the time is going to come when all these wars will cease. We are in the middle of a comedy, not a tragedy. I'm a fan of Shakespeare. You can always tell with Shakespeare which of the two you're reading by looking at the end. If everybody's getting married at the end, you're in a comedy. If everyone's dying at the end, you're in a tragedy. And guess what? I have not only read Shakespeare, I've read the Bible too. And how does the Bible end? In a wedding. The wedding feast of the Lamb. It doesn't end in a tragedy with everybody dying. It ends in a wedding. We are part of a story that's ultimate arc is a good arc. It's a comedy, not a tragedy. It ends in joy, not heartache, sorrow, and despair. And if we're wrapped up in our own story, uh, we know in one sense our own story is going to end in death, right? I'm now 67, and all these things that I used to laugh about when I was 17 are now like prayer requests in my small group. You know, it's kind of like, oh, this is going to come, right? But that's part of the beauty of the Christian story. It doesn't actually end in death. It ends in resurrection and opens the door into new heavens, new earth, new creation, the kingdom of God. It's a wonderful, wonderful hope and promise that we're given. And in light of that, panic should really have no place among us. No matter what we fear about our country, no matter what we fear about the election, and no matter how legitimate those fears are. Remember, I'm not the guy who's saying, hey, don't worry, be happy, it's no big deal. It may very well be a big deal. It feels like a big deal to me. I'm just saying God is bigger. God is bigger. And we need to find our hope in that. Modern evangelical political discourse has a knack for sounding like we're, we're a sandcastle on the beach and the tide is rising. And if you don't give $50 to the organization, your sandcastle will be swept out to sea tomorrow afternoon. But that's not a biblical view. The biblical view is God will build his church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. We are the rock 
against which the wave crashes and then recedes. We are not the bug, we're the windshield. And so the hope of the church is a secure hope. And we need to drop anchor in that and not panic, but rather faithfully persist. That's the calling that really comes to us. All right, having said those things, let me just close by giving a couple of comments about things we might do to foster our sense of, I don't know what to call it, fear resistance. Uh, what are some things we could do to help put this into practice? Um, one of the things I would really encourage you to do is actually to cultivate convictions. Firmly held sense of right and wrong. This is why I talk about the Winsome Conviction Project. I am a huge fan of convictions. And the reason I'm a fan of convictions is that they help us abide. Right back to the first thing, they keep us in our place of refuge. They keep us attached to God who's our help. They keep us looking to God who's our hope. Because in the midst of fear, it's really, really easy to say, this isn't working, I'm going to go do something else. I'm not going to honor my moral convictions. I will go with whoever will give me power. I will go with whatever perceived protection I can find in the hope of man. And convictions are one of those things that just make you stop and say, but I can't do that. That sounds prudent. That sounds reasonable in this moment. But... I have decided that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And when I begin fearing man and thinking what I do for man is the most important thing, I've set myself up to become a fool in the Proverbs definition. In other words, a person who does not fear God first, but puts some other fear before him. So convictions help keep us anchored in God. To say, nevertheless... I stand with God. Another thing that's really helpful is actually listening to people on the other side. I know it sounds a bit crazy, but here's a great quote. This comes from Monica Guzman, who's a person that I've had some contact with uh, through a group called Braver Angels that I do some things with and for, have done some things with and for. And uh, she, she wrote, did a TED Talk called uh, How Curiosity Will Save Us how curiosity will save us. And she's talking in, the, in a political context here. But she had a great quote in there. She said, whoever is underrepresented in your life will be overrepresented in your imagination. If you don't know anybody who's a Democrat, Republican, Trump supporter, Harris supporter, whoever it is on the other side, I don't know what your affiliations are, I'm just saying... If you don't know and talk to anyone on the other side, they become overrepresented in your imagination. And the fears begin to increase. And it's uncanny what happens when you get people together in the same room. I'm in the middle of a group called More Than an Election right now. And it's a video thing. A bunch of people across the country meet together. But we have a bunch of people who are right-leaning, a bunch of people who are left-leaning. And you get together and talk. And it's uncanny how much it demystifies the other side. How much you're able to stop and say, oh, this person's actually a human, and how easy it is to dehumanize and even demonize those we don't know and those we refuse to listen to. And believe me, you don't have to agree with them after you're done listening, but in all likelihood, you'll find them way more human and way less terrifying than you thought you would. One final note on this. Um, walk humbly with your God. One of our biggest problems in this is we tend to take over control when we feel like God is not controlling adequately. Lord, you're supposed to be in control of this thing. You're not doing your job. I bet you need some help. It's a big world. You're probably tired. Let me step in and cover this one for you. I've got the elections in America this year. You don't have to worry about... We're good. Um, and, and I'm like, you know what? That is just not landing your airplane in an airport that you want to be at. Um, walk humbly with your God. Trust that he is able to accomplish the things that concern you. 
and leave those things in his hands and don't grab them into your own. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so incredibly grateful for you being our, our, <laughs> our refuge, our help, and our hope in times that are genuinely scary. Lord, we are so grateful for that gift that you give us and help us to walk in it, holding your hand tightly, abiding in you, and trusting in you to accomplish the things that concern us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.